how's it going everyone? So uh, today we're going to be talking about dreams. Um, so uh, as we finished with the sleep stages previously, um, dreams are a aspect of REM sleep. Uh, it is a sign that your brain is really active and so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what dreams are, how are they manifested, what's the purpose of them. Um, so when we're looking at dreams, um, one of the things that you've got to recognize is, you know, dreams are strange, they're weird, they're uh, uh, emotional, they can bring about strong imagery. Um, sometimes we wake up and we can't, it's hard to differentiate from what is reality and what is uh, a dream uh, before we usually, you know, shake ourselves back into reality. Um, dreams um, have a way of uh, making us uh, see things that have happened in our past or possibly kind of, you know, sometimes it feels like, wait a minute, uh, the deja vu moment. I feel like I've dreamed about this before. I've experienced this before. Um, dreams are oftentimes negative. Uh, generally speaking, eight out of 10, every 10 dreams has some sort of negative aspect to it. Um, common negative aspects are being chased, uh, being embarrassed, uh, being powerless, uh, stuff like that always seems to uh, kind of factor themselves into different aspects of dreams. And so uh, dreams are strange. And so what we need to do is we need to take a look at whether or not uh, dreams have any type of purpose. Uh, so we have three theories that are going to explore this idea of why do we dream? Is there a purpose to them? Is there a reason why the body is doing this? We spend a lot of our life sleeping and a, you know, a decent percentage of that time dreaming, are those dreams important? And is this something that we should kind of focus in on and understand? So once again, we're gonna talk about three different uh, theories on this, and each of these theories is going to have a specific um, way of trying to explain, you know, what is the purpose of these dreams? So let's start with the first one. Uh, the first one is the information processing theory. And basically, this is a method, uh, the, the reason why we dream, the information processing theory says, the reason why we dream is so that we can sort out um, the, and process the things that, or understand the things that have happened to us throughout the days. Um, the memories that we've stored from short term to long term, we are trying to process those things out and figure out, okay, you know, what is going on here? Um, so. Uh, REM sleep generally increases after events that have been really, really stressful. Um, so uh, an example of this is when you do studies on dreams in places that have just had natural disasters or any type of disaster, whether hurricanes or tornadoes or floods or, uh, you know, 9-11 was another example. Um, basically what you could do is if you went in, and they've done this with several different places, um, when you go and take surveys of people who have had dreams or of just the people in the area who've been affected, what you'll find is that there is a steady increase of nightmares being recorded in the months that follow major disasters. And so what is happening is people are processing the things that have happened to them. And so nightmares are Based, based on the information processing theory are ways that your brain helps you cope with things that happen. Um, so uh, you can think of something a little bit more simple. Think of having a nightmare. Um, your brain is likely to have, you know, uh, not a nightmare, excuse me, of a scary movie. Uh, you are likely to have nightmares the following nights as your brain is trying to help you cope and process with the fear that you had in that experience of watching that TV show. Um, or that movie. Uh, another example uh, is, uh, you know, studying for classes. Your teachers always tell you, hey, get a good night's rest before an exam. Well, that's really important because all that stuff that you've been studying for the hours before bed, when you actually sleep, your brain takes all that information and kind of stores it away, files it together. It helps you organize that information so that you can better remember it for the exam. So next time you have a test, make sure you get a good eight hours of sleep. Um, it is more important to get an extra hour of sleep than it is to get an extra hour of studying, so long as you know the content. If you don't know anything, you gotta just study. So that's the information processing theory, and that is what it says about 
uh, why we need to, um, or what is the importance of dreams. Okay, so the next one is a little bit off the rails. Uh, so this is Freud's wish fulfillment theory. And this is going to be our first dive into Sigmund Freud. So this is going to get a little bit strange, but that's okay. Uh, it'll be kind of cool. All right, so we have this picture here of the, uh, of like a, I don't know, just something cool. It's like a little lake and, and whatnot uh, with the reflecting water. So Sigmund Freud um, believes in what is known as the unconscious mind. Okay, so what I've drawn here for you is an iceberg. Okay, so Sigmund Freud, and this is not a good drawing because I need the iceberg to be bigger at the bottom. Okay, so here's and then really big iceberg underneath. Okay, so the idea, stuff on top is much smaller than what's on the bottom. Okay, so Sigmund Freud had a lot of really crazy and weird ideas that not a lot of people really understood at the time. And um, he is one of the reasons why people really got into psychology is because he really introduced some ideas that other people hadn't really even ever thought of or people kind of thought was a little bit crazy. So Sigmund Freud believed that our mind was split into two parts. The top part, what was above the surface, is what is known as our conscious mind. It is the part of ourselves that we show to the world. It is the thing that you are thinking about. It is the personality that you project to your peers and to your teachers. It is what other people see. That is your conscious mind. It is what is on the surface. But just like an iceberg, what is below the surface is more substantial. So underneath the surface is what is known as the unconscious mind unconscious mind. And I apologize if this isn't, uh, if this is poorly written. The unconscious mind. Okay, so you can break the unconscious mind into three parts. You can describe the unconscious mind in three ways. So one, because it is below the surface, it is something that is not seen. It is something that cannot be accessed. Sigmund Freud believed that there was a part of ourself that we could not see or could not access, okay? That part of ourself was primal. It was full of thoughts of rage. It is full of selfish desires. Um, Sigmund Freud believed that the unconscious mind was full of what we call the id. And we'll talk about the id a little bit later, but it was full of our most base desires. You see someone really attractive across the street and you want to, you, the your unconscious mind, that primal desire wants to go and make babies with them. You see a person that uh, you don't, you dislike, the unconscious mind wants to tear them limb from limb, not just, you know, be mean to them, but just beat them into a bloody pulp. It has these primal desires. So it is unseen, it has primal desires, and finally, and probably most significantly, it is our true self. Sigmund Freud believed that the unconscious mind was who you truly were. The thing that was on top, the personality that we projected out to the world was simply a, uh, a mask, something that society, a mask that society had built for you, uh, a mask that you could show the rest of the world to fit in, but it was not truly who you were. The unconscious mind, now that's where you truly lay. That was your true self. And so Sigmund Freud believed that through his therapy, he could help a person access this unconscious thought, this unconscious part of them. But it wasn't easy, and there were only some very specific ways in order to do that. And one of those ways was through dream interpretation. So Freud's wish fulfillment theory basically says this. The reason why we dream is because the unconscious mind is buried beneath the surface. It cannot get out, except for when you are dreaming. When you are dreaming, your, your unconscious mind gets to, you know, kick, it up, kick out, let off some steam, go wild and crazy, and do all sorts of, you know, ludicrous things. And so in, the, in Freud's 
mindset, the, this wish fulfillment theory, it says it right there, wish fulfillment. It's all the things that you can't do. Um, you know, getting revenge on people that have slighted you, uh, you know, making children with P or the process of making children with people you find really attractive. That's what the unconscious mind wants. And now that you are asleep, you can get out into that thing. So that's the Freud's wish fulfillment theory. It is an opportunity for your unconscious mind to let loose and go crazy. Now, this seems a little contradictory. When we first talked about dreams, we talked about how dreams are often really like kind of disappointing. Like eight out of 10 dreams have some sort of negative connotation. That doesn't sound like a wish fulfillment. That doesn't sound like the unconscious mind getting to go crazy. Where are all our dreams about sex? Where are all our dreams about getting revenge? We're all getting, we're all busy, too busy getting chased around by evil clowns with chainsaws. So something's wrong here. There's some sort of disconnect, which brings us to one of the two aspects of Freud's wish fulfillment theory. So Freud is going to break his theory into kind of two different parts. Dreams you can split into two different parts. The first part is the what is known as the manifest content. So the manifest content is the story, the remembered storyline of the dream. So when you wake up and you tell Sigmund Freud what dream you had, this is what he would call the manifest content. So an example would be a patient goes into Sigmund Freud's office and Sigmund Freud asks him, all right, well, I had you write in a dream journal. What did you write? And the person reads, um, well, in my dream, um, I had a gun and uh, my friend was there. Uh, my guy, my guy friend was there and I, I shot him. And so Sigmund Freud would be like, okay, well, this is the manifest content of the dream. This is the censored or symbolic version of the dream. So Sigmund Freud would say, well, you know what? We really don't have, uh, you know, like even though you're in your dream, your unconscious mind still actually can't kick about and do whatever the heck it wants. Unfortunately, your dreams are censored by your conscious mind. The conscious mind believes that even in sleep, the thoughts of the unconscious are not safe. And so all of our dreams are censored. They all have a mask on. And so this remembered storyline of the dream is fake. So what Sigmund Freud was able to do, or what he believed he was able to do, was he was his job was to interpret what those dreams meant. And Sigmund Freud's first textbook was actually on the interpretation of dreams. So if you go online and you look at, um, you know, dream interpreter, you have a dream and you type in what it is. There's several websites that and books that do that. Um, a good foundation for a lot of those um, reasons why you're having those dreams stems from Sigmund, Sigmund Freud's work. Not all of them, of course, but a lot, of them, a lot of them. And so he wrote several books on the interpretation of dreams. Now, the latent content is what the dream actually meant. You have the manifest content, which is the storyline, the thing that you remember. But the latent content is what the dream actually meant. It's not what they say. The guy who walked into uh, Freud's office and told him that they shot his friend, well, Freud would say, well, that's the manifest concept of the dream. The latent content, the true meaning, the meaning that the unconscious mind was getting out was, well, the gun, the gun's your penis. And because this is a guy, the gun's your penis and your friend over there that you shot, well, that means that you, you know, basically want to have sex with him. And so Sigmund Freud would be like, well, that's the, that's what we would call homosexual tendencies. Now, back when Sigmund Freud was running around, um, homosexuality was considered a psychological disorder. It was in the DSM. It was classified as a psychological disorder. Times have changed, culture has changed. And so that has no longer the case. Um, and we'll talk about what that, the reasons for that when we get uh, a little further along. But this is what Sigmund Freud believed, that he could interpret your dreams and that if he could interpret your dreams, he could better understand your unconscious mind and better understand you. So there you go, Sigmund Freud's wish fulfillment theory. All right, so next, 
we have the last of the theories, which is much less exciting than Sigmund Freud's, but it'll be a good way to round this off. So this is the activation synthesis theory. So the activation synthesis theory is basically this. Your brain throughout the night randomly activates. It turns on and off at random times and in random places. And so what is happening here, <clears throat> excuse me, what is happening here is that the brain, whatever areas of the brain activates, the reason why you are dreaming is because those areas are what you dream about. So um, if Mr. Monk is uh, dreaming about, uh, if Mr. Monk is riding a bicycle, um, when Mr. Monk is riding a bicycle, you know, this part of the brain is active, that part of the brain is actually active while he's riding that bicycle. When he is dreaming, those parts of the brain are also active. Active. This is why we want to be paralyzed during this time, during REM sleep. And so that's the same thing with the activation synthesis theory. The reason why that's happening is while you were asleep, while you were dreaming, those two parts of the brain randomly activated. And the way that your brain processed that is that you had a dream about you riding a bike, which is often explains or describes why dreams can be so random and strange is through this activation synthesis theory. Now to round all of this off, Sigmund Freud's wish fulfillment theory, very silly, doesn't exist, isn't like, it doesn't actually describe why you have dreams, but it is a thing that you do need to know because they'll definitely ask you on the AP exam. Now, activation synthesis theory um, and information processing theory, those two theories um, both do a good job of explaining why it is that we dream. And even though they don't sound like they're the same thing, they sound like two different things, they don't push against each other. They don't, um, you know, one is not better than the other, okay? The wishful, uh, not wishful fulfillment theory, excuse me, the activation synthesis theory sometimes explains why you have certain dreams. The information processing theory sometimes explains why you have other dreams. And oftentimes the two of them do both at the same time explain why you have certain dreams. It's just the way it goes. Don't think of them as contradictory. Just think of them as two different theories that oftentimes are the same. And there you go, sleeping and dreaming. Uh, if you have any questions, please make sure that you guys ask me, but otherwise you all have a great day and thanks for listening.